Okay, everybody. Well, we're going to get into some time in the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles today, I'm going to invite you to open them up to Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> how many people know how many chapters are in the book of Acts? Yeah, about 27, 27 books. So, so far, we've... Is it 28? Yeah, that's right. That's right. 28. Correct the pastor. Uh, yeah, so 28 chapters. Uh, we are today in chapter 18, so we're making our way through this book. I think uh, we're coming up on about 30 weeks so far. And by the time we're finished, I think we will have spent 49 weeks. But do you know why we spend so much time in a book of the Bible? Because time to become formed uh, uh, to that word. And it's my heart that we would uh, be formed in the image of the early church. That we would be for our generation for theirs. And so uh, that's my heart. So 49 weeks, I think we will have gotten this stuff in our blood. Wouldn't you say? Okay. So today is Acts, Acts chapter 18. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the subject of being dependent. Being dependent. And that's kind of a bad word in American society because nobody wants to be somebody's dependent. Right? We want to be uh, independent. And we as Americans are Fiercely independent people, independent of one another and independent of God. We know that we need to be dependent people, but something about that just is very, very difficult for us, especially as Americans. <clears throat> so we think it's a bad thing to need help. And we're almost a little bit of ashamed of, of needing somebody's help. We don't like to ask for help. We think it betrays a sense of weakness, that we should be self-sufficient, self-reliant. That's like the epitome of American culture. And if we reach that place, then we feel that we have become successful. And if for a period of time that we were fairly self-reliant in life, and then maybe later in life when we need to ask for more and more help, there, that's sometimes hard to overcome. For some people. So this can be uh, seen in a poem called Invictus. Invictus written by William Ernest Henley, 1875. Uh, it's a beautiful poem. Um, it's about five stanzas long, but I'm just going to read that fin final stanza, and it says this. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my I am the captain of my soul. Now, those words, uh, Americans eat that stuff up. We love that kind of talk. Uh, this guy here, William Ernest Hindley, wrote this when he was young. He contracted tuberculosis of the bone. And he had to get his uh, left leg amputated just below the knee. And so he was in the hospital recovering, and Henry, or Henley, uh, wrote this poem, Invictus, which means unconquerable. I mean, we put, like, this stuff in songs and moves, and we put it into our veins as Americans. Man, this, this is what we live on. Uh, so this poem really, though, uh, to me, is a poem, uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is a recipe for disaster. If you really want to uh, learn how to get along in God's way of things, this is poison for your soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It basically means I'm enough. I can do it. I can and I will pull myself up by my bootstraps. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and this kind of mentality has, has, has this kind of mentality has enormous stress lurking in the shadows. This kind of attitude 
produces all kinds of unnecessary anxiety. Because we're trying to live up to something that is not sustainable. You can't sustain that kind of attitude through life. <clears throat> so you know what? You want to know what anxiety is? A- anxiety is, uh, I like this definition, self on its own. You guys hear that? Self, let that sink in. Self on its own. That is the sum total of anxiety. If you want to go there, that's what it looks like. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul is self on its own. But what happens when you need to declare bankruptcy? What happens when you have no food to eat? No money to pay the bills? What happens when you suffer a nervous breakdown? What happens when you get diagnosed with a terminal illness? You lose a loved one, get betrayed, get stabbed in the back. Your heart gets shattered. I am the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. That, that is a gross overestimation of your ability to pull yourself together. There's times in your life when you go way beyond this whole conception. So if I'm honest, I am not the master of anything. Are you the master of anything? Truly? I am the master of nothing. But how many people know that if God is in the equation, you don't have to be? Amen? Because God provides. And that's the thesis of the message today, is that God provides. If you hear anything today, I want you to hear that. I want you to remember that. I want you to rehearse that statement. God provides. Genesis chapter 22 it says it like this. The Lord will provide or the Lord will see to it. I love that. You got a problem in your life. You got an issue in your life. You got a challenge. The Lord will see to it. Isn't that good news? So that sounds so much less stressful. God's going to see to that. He's going to handle that. And so in Acts chapter 18, the the passage we're in today shows us that there's a different way of going about life. God says to us, either it's on you or it's on me. Either you can do it or I can do it for you. And so we're going to read this uh, this passage here in Acts chapter 18. Hope you have your Bibles. Acts 18 verses 1 through 18. And I want you to see. That at every hand's turn in this passage, God was providing for Paul. All right? So we're going to start with verse 1, and I'm going to pray. Lord, I pray, God, as we go into your word, that you will speak to us. You will open up places that are closed, places that were un, that are unrecognized, places that we're not trusting you all the way. I pray that you would read us. As we read your word, that you would turn around and read our soul and get into us and help us understand the kind of life, the kind of way you want us to live our life for Christ's sake. Amen. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Okay, last week we were in Athens, and Paul was all by himself. Remember that? So I got a map up there that kind of kind of give you a, a sense of where he's at. This is uh, modern-day Greece. He was in Athens last week all by himself. This week he is 50 miles uh, the what west, and it's in the city of Corinth. And he found a na- and, and he found a Jew named Aquila a native of Pontus, 
recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius, Emperor Claudius, Caesar of the empire, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, Aquila and Priscilla. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. Because he probably needed support money. He was running low. He was on the end, the tail end of his second journey. For they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy finally arrived from Macedonia, because he's been in Athens, now he's in Corinth, he's been waiting for his buddies from Macedonia. And when they finally arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. NIV puts it this way, that he was devoted, he had devoted himself exclusively to preaching the word because Silas and Timothy probably showed up with a bunch of support money. He was able to hit the streets again every single day. So Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ, that the Messiah was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he got upset. And he shook out the garments. He shook out his garments and said, your blood be heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. We heard this before in Acts 13. He did the same thing, shook out the dust. From his feet. I'm turning to the Gentiles, but he kept coming back to the Jews. He loved the Jews, Paul did. And he left there, verse 7 says, and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Paul says, I'm going next door. Set up my base of operations next door. And get this, verse 8. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, eventually believed in the Lord. This was the guy, this was the synagogue that he got kicked out of, that he, that he left. And yet now the ruler, the leader of the synagogue is getting saved because he's next door preaching gospel. So Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, don't be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people and he stayed there. A year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, this is a Roman leader, official kind of dude. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, which is a court, saying, This man is persuading the people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo, the Roman, said, that, said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions and words and names of your own law, in other words, a Jewish theological debate, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And get this, verse 17, they all seized Sosthenes, which was apparently a, the new ruler of the synagogue, and beat him, because the other guy got saved. So this new ruler of the synagogue, they beat him in front of the tribunal. That's weird probably because of his mismanagement of Paul's case. You idiot! Just right there in front of the court, beating their leader. But also probably trying to rouse up uh, kind of concern that, that you know, maybe Galileo would be afraid of an uprising. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. It didn't work. He wasn't taking the bait. 
And verse 18 says, and this, after this, Paul stayed many days longer. So I want you to see in this narrative that Paul was provided for at every hand's turn. Now, just to, when you read the Bible, this is what I like to try to do. You can either read it, you can study it, or you can enter the text. You can get into the story, and you can see the colors and smell the, the fragrance, and you can experience what's happening, and that's what I want us to do anytime we're in this narrative. Imagine this. Put yourself in Paul's shoe. He shows up all by himself, no moral support. Can you imagine going to a city and nobody is with you? He has no lodging. He has no job. His support money is running low. The bank account is running low. He had no base of operations. And that means something when you're trying to do ministry. And then later in the story, he gets sued. Can you imagine getting sued? People taking legal action against you? This is, this is stressful stuff. This, this is enormous pressure. Can you imagine? We, 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 we sit and, 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 and read these things not realizing this is like, if I was in Paul's shoes... I would be freaking out. So this is stressful, enormous pressure. Totally unsettled. I think one of the most unsettling things in, in, in life is like moving. I mean, Paul's always on the move. But when I, when I move, I realize, man, upheaval, chaos, uncertainty. We were in Pullman for 17 years, got married over there, stayed, had a, had a job, had a family, had two little kids at the time. This was before Elijah was born. And we decide to move across the state to Vancouver so that I can start going to seminary. And it was complete upheaval. Didn't know what we were doing. Didn't know who we were going to meet on the other side. Didn't have a church family. Left one of 17 years to go find another one. We didn't know where to start. Starting from scratch, that's stressful. And so we came over here in Audrey's job. She got a job, and, and, and so I didn't have a job, and, and I was going to find one when I got over here. But once we got over, we got pregnant with a third child. And so we knew that we would have three kids in nursery. That would be a lot of money. So I decided to stay home with all three children and do school. And then uh, Audrey would work and we would manage the finances, pay for the, pay for the bills. But about after about three, four weeks of being here, she, she's pregnant and she gets notice that her job was being eliminated. That's stressful. Baby on the way, one job, and we have no means of paying for the bills. This is Paul. This is all that Paul knows. He's just going from one location to the next, wondering how God's going to work this out. And so even moving down here to Gresham, we moved up in Vancouver, uh, bought a house in Washougal, had to sell, come down here in 2017 to be a part of this community. And, uh, you know, that was another stressful time. I think it was maybe... Midway through the sale, we found out that we had about another $10,000 bill to pay. We didn't know how to do this. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Stressful. Anybody been there? I feel like I'm all by myself. Give me some head nods or something. This is what life looks like when, when, when you're going from one spot to the next and nothing's for, for sure. Nothing's for certain. It's going to be stressful stuff. And some of you this afternoon are facing uncertainty. Future is not hammered out. Right? You have insurmountable debt. You have bills piling up. Your health is touch and go. 
Uh, you have broken relationships. Perhaps you're dealing with trauma issues, trust issues, addiction issues. Maybe you feel out of control. I am the master of my fate doesn't work in situations like this. It's not, it, it's, it doesn't alleviate any sense of stress. And I believe this passage offers us a different approach because we don't see Paul sweating a thing in this passage. He's in the middle of dire straits and he's not stressing at all. He's trusting that God is going to take care of things. And as he is in Corinth, he's writing the books of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And if you want to get his attitude, read those small letters that he writes to that church. And you can see that Paul is as joyful and as peaceful and as, and as happy as a clam. No stress. And my proposition today is when you're going through stressful times, that you can have the attitude of Paul if you realize that God will provide. So my thesis here is God provides. God, say it with me. God, God provides. provides. Let's say it again. God provides. God provides. He provides. And so when you're looking at uh, an uncertain situation, oh, please draw up on that short, small, but potent truth. God provides. So I want to show this, show you this, how this works in this text here. Verses 1 through 4, when the funds are low, okay? Say it again. God provides. God provides. When the funds are low. God provides. Anybody have low funds? <laughs> I do. <laughs> God provides provides. Look at this. He shows up in Corinth. He's running out of money. We can know that from several different spots. Philippians 4 and uh, 2 Corinthians 12. He's out of money. And so what does he have to do? He has to find a job. And immediately after arriving in Corinth, next verse is he found a Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla they were tent makers. They just got expelled to Rome. And what does it say here in verse 3? It says that he stayed with them. So he shows up. He had no place to, to rest his head for the night. He stays immediately with a, 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 a Christian couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And together they worked. All three of them were tent makers. And so he picked up a job. He found what? Lodging. And work right away. No stress. What did God do? He provided. Lodging and work, God provides. The second thing here in verses 5 through 8, if you look through this, this, uh, this narrative here, is that he is, uh, he is in the synagogue. He's ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's preaching, and they are just stiff-necked. They are reviling him. They're op opposing him, and it, it wasn't conducive to ministry. So he didn't have a base of operations. He went there to do ministry, and how are you supposed to do ministry when you don't have a place to do ministry from? And so immediately, we see that he gets kind of shunned from this place. He leaves, and in verse 7, it says that he left there and he went to the house of a man named Titius Justice and he established his ministry headquarters there. Right next door to the synagogue and he's doing so much ministry. It says all kinds of people are responding and even the ruler of the synagogue gets saved. That's amazing. So not only did God give him... Um, a job and lodging. He gave him a base of operations. Somebody say, God provides. God provides. And then here in verse, uh, verses 9 through 17, again, he comes. He, he doesn't have anything. He gets lodging. He gets a job. He gets ministry headquarters. And then all of a sudden, 
enemies start forming around his ministry and they haul him into court. I would hate to be sued. And yet here is people taking legal action against him. He opens up his mouth in his own defense and he doesn't even, he doesn't even get one word out before Galileo says, I'm dismissing this case. And the last verse says, and then Paul stayed for many days longer with legal protection from the empire. God provides. He provides lodging and work. He provides a base of operations. And he provides legal protection. And notice that all of this provision comes through people. People. So in life, make sure that you never turn your back on people. Because I don't care who they are. They can be believing or unbelieving. God will use people to provide provision for you. Aquila and Priscilla were believing Jews. Great. Titius and Justice were believing Gentiles. Wow, great. Galileo was an unbelieving Gentile. So it doesn't have to just come from your own tribe. God will provide through anybody. But it's God that's doing the providing. So don't ever turn your back on people. Quite often we see God's provision coming through people. We can't do life without people. Hello? But we can't do life without God. Remember, anxiety is self on its own. Self on, on its own. But most importantly, God says here in verse 10, look at verse 10. It says here, do not be afraid, Paul, but go on speaking and do not be silent for what? What does it say there? Say it loud. I am with you. That is the best news you can ever have knowledge of. God is with you. Despite your challenges, despite your frustrations, despite your adversity, God says, I am with you. And if you, if you make me the master of your fate, and the captain of your soul, you won't have to worry about a thing. How's that sound? <laughs> Amen. So you ever have uh, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to say that. Uh, You ever have somebody relieve you of a job? It's like you had a job for a long time, and, and it, it was your job. You took pride in it. You took responsibility for it. And you know, yeah, you didn't need to do that. You don't need to. Somebody else can do that for you, and it's kind of hard to give it up. And, and they find that you give it up, and they're doing just as good as, as you are. And it, and it actually kind of feels good. I didn't have to be the one who did that. And somebody came along and did it, and it just kind of relieved you of that task. That's what God wants to do. You're taking so much responsibility on your own shoulders, and God says, can you give that back to me? That's, the jo that's my job. That's what I want to do for you, and you're doing it for yourself. Stressing yourself out. Let me have that. And he puts it on his shoulders and it's off of your shoulders. You, you have just been relieved of a burdensome task. Of trying to provide for yourself. And God says, would you just trust me with that? Psalm 138 says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Sometimes I think that's my job. God, God, I need to figure out God's purpose, and then I need to fulfill it. 
says in another translation, the Lord will work out his plan for my life. That's good news. He will work out his plan. He has a plan and he will work it out and he is faithful to complete that which he begun. So if you're here today and you've responded to Jesus, you know that God has begun a work. And guess what? He's the one that's going to bring it to completion. Not you. Not me. So when problems uh, come your way, uh, you can say something like this. I'm going to pass this off to you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you this problem. Don't you hate when people like give you their problems? <laughs> God doesn't mind. I don't, I don't want your problems. <laughs> Even as your pastor. I don't want your problems. I'll walk beside you, but you keep your own problems. <laughs> I'm not taking it. I don't even know how to handle my own. But God... He'll come along and say, he says, hey, no, I'll take your problem. Just give it to me. You don't need to worry about that. Just, just give that. That's my job. Bob Laughlin. Anybody remember Bob Laughlin? Longtime member of the church. Passed away last, last year. He told a story of when he uh, was in his 60s. He received a cancer diagnosis of incurable prostate cancer and this is what he said he said I'm giving it to you God in other words I'm giving you the concern of this diagnosis this is not my problem this is this is your problem now I like that attitude he always told his children that when he was diagnosed he says, I've bundled up this sickness and I've given it back to you. It's your business now. I like that. You got a problem, you got, a, you got, you got an immense load of pressure, stress. Just bundle it all up and give it back to God. I'll do what I do. I'll, I'll, I'll do what I need to do, right? Uh, but I'm not carrying the concern. That's on you. And after 10 years of treatment, he did what he was supposed to do, okay? He, he got treatment, all that stuff, right? After 10 years of treatment, Bob was declared cancer-free, and the cancer never returned, and he lived into his 90s. Incurable cancer. So when the world tries to put something on you, it's not your concern. Whatever happens is what God's going to let happen. Don't carry the concern, you weren't made for that. It wasn't meant for your shoulders. It was meant for the shoulders of God. So say you get a bill and you can't pay. Okay, Lord, your bill now. How's that sound? <laughs> you take care of it. God did it for Bob. He can do it for you. If God did it for Paul, he can do it for you. He can do it for all of us. But here's the trick. You have to pick God first place in your life. Listen to the words of Jesus. I was talking to my friend Jordan here. He, he reminded me of this verse just a couple of weeks ago, and it came back to me when I was preparing this, this message. Uh, it's Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 33, but I'm going to back up just a little bit. I'm going to read kind of a big section here. I want you just to drink this in. This is good for your soul. Okay, we need to apprehend this truth because all too many times Christians walk around stressed out and we don't need to because we're taking on a job that doesn't belong to us. God will provide. But we've got to put them at number one. Uh, verse 24 in chapter 6 says this, No one can serve two masters. This is Jesus. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Know about your body, what you will put on. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither, uh, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God will close the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious. Do not be anxious, saying, what shall I eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But here it is. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, these concerns will be added to you. All these concerns, anxieties will be provided for you. That's the promise of Jesus. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be stressed out. Don't be preoccupied. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, stay in the moment. That, that's what Paul was doing in, in Corinth. He had all kinds of things to wig out about. He stayed in the moment. And he let God take care of all the future. Do your best. And he'll take care of the rest. That doesn't mean you do the best to, to provide for yourself. I mean, you, you do what you need, you're called to do, right? You don't just slough off. But you're not going to you're not going to be the one who ultimately provides. Do your best to put God number one. Seek first his kingdom, his priorities, his, his values. Put number one in your life, and he will add all these things unto you. Paul shows up in Corinth with nothing. Nothing. And God provides him with a lodging, a temporary job, more support money from Macedonia, a base of operations, ministry impact, and legal protection. That's what God does. And he wants to do the same thing for you. You're just like Paul. Sometimes you will show up and you ain't got nothing. And you can't affect nothing. But God can. Paul was about God's priorities. He was seeking first the kingdom and God just came along and just did everything. So I would say God was looking out for Paul and we don't detect a shred of anxiety on his part. So stay busy. Stay at it. Watch God provide. He always shows up. God comes to the rescue every single day time. I'll have that music team come on up. You know, we know this in theory. God provides. But anytime we're posed with a new situation, we immediately say, how? I know that you provide for me, but how are you, how are you going to do this? This seems so impossible. And yet he does every single time quell the questions. Let those subside from your mind. Don't try to figure it out. 2 Corinthians 9 says, God is able. Say that with me. God is able. One more time. God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things, in all times, you may abound in every good work. God is able. He is able. He is able. 
Am I talking to somebody today? Get into your soul. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Are you stressed? Oftentimes we are. Trying to do it on your own? Oftentimes we are. Please hear this word. God will provide. First his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. So as we close with this final song, um, we've been trying to do this more and more. We're always going to just open up the front here. If people wanted to come, spend some time with Jesus. If you want to be prayed for, uh, we'll have people up here praying for you as well. Um, church is not a spectator sport. We're not supposed to just come and watch, hear, walk away. So whatever this looks like for you to step in, like we, just, we don't just read the text, we don't just study the text, we're trying to enter into the text. There's a promise. When God speaks through his word, God is promising something to us. How do we step into that? And so we want to provide a time for you to, to step in if you need some prayer, if you need to spend some time with Jesus, whatever that looks like for you. But make sure you embody these messages. Don't just come and listen. You're not here just to have a mind tintillated. You, you, you want to be able to step in. What does that look like? Where are you at in your life? Let's respond to Jesus. So I ask you to stand to your feet. Let's long together and come up if you want to want some